The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. We're going to wait a couple more minutes just so that um, everybody finishes signing in. Thank you for your patience. Hello. Hello, Timothy. We're just about to get started. Let me. Let me... Uh, okay. Just want to confirm that you can hear me. I've been trying. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Um, okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and get started then. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for everyone for joining us today. Welcome to our second webinar in our joint series between the AfriChild Center and the CPC Learning Network, where we elevate the amazing work happening in Uganda. I'm Evelyn Marquez from the CPC Learning Network, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. And we have Timothy, the Executive Director of AfriChild with us here. Uh, thank you very much, Evelyn, and thank you for everybody for joining in on this webinar from wherever you are. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to you all. Um, we're privileged to be sharing with you part of the work that we're doing at the Happy Child Center. The Happy Child Center is a multidisciplinary research center, and we are based out of Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda. Our primary focus is, is research uh, to generate evidence that would help influence both practice and policy. But one of the other core areas of focus that we have as an institution is really building um, and the next generation of young researchers, so really contributing to addressing the gap around uh, researchers uh, within the country, but also extending to the region. And it's this work that we intend to share with you through this webinar. Uh, we'll be hearing more about this work. So I welcome you all and I'd like to thank uh, the CPC Network for the collaboration. I'd also like to thank uh, the panelists who are our, uh, our associates at the Africa Child Center and also my colleague Matthew, uh, together with whom uh, are going to be making this presentation. Uh, you're welcome, and I hope you find it um, a learning and uh, quite a productive experience. Over back to you, Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. And I would also like to introduce Alfred, who is also from the Afro Child Center, who will be co moderating with me today. Um, and so we, we can begin. So to begin, we're going to start off with Professor Fred Wabuire Manjian. He is a veteran researcher in child health and demography, educationist and practitioner with extensive experience working with leading international research institutions. He was also the senior mentor and lead trainer at the Inter-University Training. And I am just going to let him be the presenter now.
Thank you very much, Evelyn. And good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you. In the next couple of minutes, 10 or so minutes, I'll be sharing with you my presentation, which is entitled Overview of the Inter-University Child Focused Training Research Training. Uh, this research training was made possible by a grant from the Oak Foundation to the Africa Child Center, uh, which was meant to uh, train researchers in child-focused research methods and grant acquisitions and publications. It was expected that at the end of this training, the trainees would be able to utilize the skills acquired to undertake child-focused research and also to integrate the knowledge and skills acquired into their lectures and guide students to write research projects and dissertations. To achieve those outcomes, Africa Child and the whole team used a consultative process to develop a plan. And in this plan, uh, it had four strategies. I can't move the screen up. Four strategies. The first strategy was to conduct a training needs assessment to identify skills, knowledge, knowledge skills, and competency gaps to establish inter-university collaboration for knowledge sharing, to link trainees to mentors within their local universities, and to undertake rigorous training of university staff in child-focused research methods, grant acquisition, and scientific writing. Sorry, just, just bear with me a minute. Okay, there we go. So for the training needs assessment, uh, there were two aspects that we looked at, uh, knowledge and skills. And this graph shows uh, the, the knowledge gaps uh, that we were able to identify in the following areas. And the areas are listed on the left hand side on the Y axis, I'll not go through them. And then on the X axis are the percentages. And those percentages in yellow or orange are where the gaps are. So I'm going to concentrate on the, the bars which are in yellow. And looking at the bars in yellow, you can see that there were gaps in knowledge of IRB requirements, that is institutional review boards. There were knowledge, there were gaps, knowledge gaps in qualitative data analysis, uh, about 47%. Another 47% in child focused uh, surveys, conducting child focused surveys, and also uh, conducting qualitative uh, research studies. The next area was we looked at gaps in skills and the skills which we were interested in are also on the left hand side of this panel. And as you can see, there were very there were high gaps in teaching quantitative research methods at around uh, 60%, 66%. There were also gaps in teaching qualitative research methods. And some of the others were not as high, but there were gaps in designing child-focused surveys. So these were the gaps that we identified in the skills. Uh, regarding the competencies, uh, this is a different type of graph, maybe easier to, to read. We had um, the highest gaps and the gaps uh, in, the, in the blue, so they were not competent. They were least competent in teaching quantitative research methods, and that was followed by uh, no least competence in determining sample size and designing quantitative uh, research studies. There were seven universities 
that were part of this collaboration. And from these seven universities, we were able to identify facilitators. On the left hand side is the list of facilitators, the four expert facilitators who are initially uh, right from the beginning of the three year training period are the ones in red are the ones who were brought on board towards the end in year three and on the right hand side are seven mentors so there was a mentor for each of the universities or higher institution before i go any further to show you um, the activities over the three years i just want to say that we had an operational definition for a child and offer operational definition for child focused research and for purposes of the training, we defined a child as a person who has not attained the legal age of consent to treatments or procedures involved in the research under the applicable law of the jurisdiction in which the research will be conducted. And for the purposes of this training, which was held in Uganda, the age, legal age of consent was taken to be 18 years. And child-focused research is the research in which children are actively involved and recognized as important participants. So it is research with children and not research on children or by children. Year one of this training activity uh, was between 1st April 2017 and 31st March 2018. Within that year, first year, we conducted the training needs assessment. We did all the identification of the trainers, mentors, and trainees. We drafted the training program and training schedule, schedule and we uh, engaged in documentation, which included the training guide, the mentors manual, and the training schedule. The first workshop, uh, which was held between June and February 2018, consisted of two modules. Each module was one week long. The first module was on research methods training, and the second module was on grants writing, the first part of grants writing. <clears throat> At the end of the first workshop, we issued a call for letters of intent. Uh, it had due dates and other timelines. We tried to simulate real world uh, practices where letters of call, uh, let, uh, calls for letters of intent are issued. Uh, and also we had a review meeting, again, simulating the real practice to shortlist these letters of intent. The outcome from module one was that participants appreciated the structure of a research proposal. And we had that opportunity since we had seven universities that had been doing it differently we were able to reach consensus on a harmonized structure across the universities. Also, um, we were able to obtain individual research proposals addressing a child-focused research area. These were written uh, based on the skills that they had acquired from the module, and the participants were then introduced to a standardized method of reviewing proposals and scoring them and they used this to engage in a peer review and score each other's proposals. From module two, the participants learned how to review a funding opportunity announcement and develop a checklist. They were able to respond to a call for applications and this call was prepared by AfriChild, again simulating a real funding opportunity announcement. AfriChild had fortunately um, some money available and were able to support uh, research activities at each participating universities. The mentors applied the NIH proposal review criteria. NIH is National Institutes of Health, uh, which was the basis that we used for training uh, uh, criteria to score the calls from the participants and provided comments. And the participants re responded to those comments in writing and in keeping with deadlines. Year two uh, had two modules as well, a continuation of grants writing. And the fourth module was data management and analysis and reporting. Uh, all candidates had their proposals from the first call approved, and the, which was good. It meant that 
uh, we had standardized the training and they had all come to about the same level. So all the applications or the proposals were approved. And because of this 100% success rate, the second call, which we had intended to have, uh, we had planned to have a second call for those who didn't go through the first time, but we canceled it because the success rate was 100%. Instead, we gave the participants more time to polish up their proposals and plan for field work. Participants uh, was also started dissemination of their research studies from the first call at the end of year two. From module three, uh, the participants learned how to register uh, under uh, those registration systems. Participants were able to search for grants under uh, the US grants.gov and other grants websites. Uh, they also undertook uh, human subjects protection course and obtained a certificate which they printed out. They were also uh, uh, they were also taught how to prepare protocols for submission to the Gulu University Research and Ethics Committee for review. We selected one of the ethics and research committee uh, research and ethics committee from a participating university uh, to handle all the proposal reviews. The participants learned how to search Google Scholar and PubMed for references and organize them using EndNote. And that was part of the training that they received. In year three, uh, we had the third workshop uh, with two modules. Again, the first module was on data management analysis and reporting. And the second module was on dissemination, publication, and research translation. The fourth workshop uh, had uh, one week which focused on dissemination, publication, and research translation, a continuation of uh, module six uh, and uh, workshop three. So in short, uh, what I've shared with you is uh, an activity that spanned a period of three years. We recruited 30 participants from seven universities and higher education institutions. They were at different levels of knowledge and skills related to child-focused research. And through the training, undertaking a series of modules within four workshops, we were able to bring them to more or less the same level. And they, were, they learned how to write grants, submit them for funding. They were successful in funding. And they went ahead to conduct uh, the field work. What they did also, we gave them an opportunity to disseminate uh, the, the research findings in a forum that was uh, at the national level. So thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Evelyn. Thank you so much. Let me just switch. Thank you so much, Professor Fred. And um, sorry for not mentioning this earlier, but if please feel free to ask questions throughout the entire webinar. We will get to them at the end, but for now, please um, put them in the questions box and we will choose some to ask to our presenters at the end. Um, next up, we have Dr. Odamakai Modest, Modest, Senior Educationist Researcher experienced in child-focused research and was the mentor and trainer at the inter-university training. Dr. Odama, you are on mute right now. One second while we try to work through these technical issues. Thank you for your patience.
Hello. 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 Hello, Dr. Odama. Feel free to begin. Hello, Evelyn. Good afternoon. Good morning. And good afternoon to you. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Odamakai Modest. And I'm very glad to be with you to speak on this subject that uh, is before us. As uh, my, my mentor and my colleague, Professor Wawire had already said, I'm so happy to hear from him and to hear from the rest of the members, some of those who will speak later. Today, I will focus on largely my experiences and the benefits that we gained through the research training program we had in the last three years. Next slide, please. As I meant, uh, my experiences from this training experience is very interesting. One of them was that the inter-university training was a very intense and exciting moment for many of us. Intense in the sense that in the two weeks, you could easily feel exhausted. At the same time, there's excitement that you know quite a bit of things that we are taught. And the members were very excited about learning more from this training. Secondly, the trainees as experts in their respective disciplines were really competent because each one had a background that was so unique in their different subject areas, their different experiences. And that was very helpful for all of us who were colleagues. And then trainees and mentors were conversant. We are not conversant with research with the children. This was quite uh, disheartening, but at the same time, it opened ways for us to learn from the trainers, from the colleagues and so forth. So we had to learn new things of learning how to do research with children because we are used to doing research on children. Academic expertise of the members and the trainers was quite good because most of them were selected after serious scrutiny of their academic backgrounds. And that was very helpful. Trainers, mentors, and trainees, and Africa child staff were cooperative and committed. I really enjoyed this because I needed an environment where people cooperate and are committed to do things. Next slide, please. Mentorship. This is the cornerstone. And for me as a mentor, I found it very challenging in the sense that some of us had not done this before. And when I was chosen as a mentor, I thought about it, read more about it, and I got used to it. So as a mentor, my job was to support my team in the, in the first place, but I would support the team through counseling them, advising them, and sometimes I had to go the extra mile of advocating for my team, especially since we come from different universities, you find private universities may not easily allow their staff to go and do something else besides what they do in their universities. So I had to advocate, lead with some of the administration in these private universities to allow us, to give us a chance to study and do research and learn with the African child. And then lastly, I had to attend child, African child meetings. And in these meetings, I would learn some things and bring updates for my team, especially in the university where I taught. And many of my colleagues also did similar things, attending meetings and so forth. Next slide. The benefits of the pro program are immense, and I would just highlight a few of them for us here. A new perspective on research with children was very, very important. For instance, many of us didn't know that children were experts. We thought it was only researchers who were experts. So that was a reawakening on our side. As uh, <laughs> university 
professors, lecturers, we had to learn something new. That's why I call it a new perspective in research. And then more so, we learned a lot of research methodology contents. Some of them, my colleague and mentor, Professor Wawire, had already alluded to earlier. And then the friendship between and among the professional colleagues was very good. And this was a benefit for us because we relied on this friendship to help us and to advise ourselves as colleagues and as trainers who would seek each other's support and help. And then development of academic writing skills was very good for us in this program because there were many contents that we had to learn. And some of these contents needed to be organized and presented in a very comprehensive, understandable way. And a part of that is to learn critical thinking in how to organize this and then how to write it academically with the citations and so forth. That was very good for us to learn during the three years. And then the research as a human activity. This was something very interesting. We had to learn in a hard way because many times you find a lecturer or a professor comes in the class, sometimes humiliates the student who is learning. But our facilitators were so human, so good, they emphasized communication. And the research as communication needs to be handled with the care, with the respect, especially respecting the people you are teaching this. And then uh, trainees as professional experts in the research. We learned and we became professional experts in research, especially research with children. And that's how we were able to start helping and advising our universities to take a venture into research with children. Afri Child, in fact, at the end of it, successfully conducted seven major research studies with the children. And this was because we were trained. And in the end, we who were trained went into the field and were able to do our research, write reports on what we research. And in the end, Afro child benefits or benefited. Next slide. The impact at the institutional level. The human resource capacity building was very real, and we had to learn how to become experts for our universities. And our universities gained a lot in that sense because our knowledge on research really increased. Our skills in the research increased. Our attitude towards uh, research also changed and we became better researchers. We even admired and we enjoyed doing research ourselves. And then institutions' receipt of print and e-resources was real. And in this case, we had the child which had some of these print and e-resources, books, we had maps, we had reports, researches done prior on uh, children, and our universities gained access to these resources. That was very good. And then support by institutional management. This was quite hard, but we had to find a way to win the support of these uh, institutions where we came from, especially the vice chancellors, the, uh, the deputy vice chancellors and deans, who would call them in America, maybe the presidents of the universities had to be accessed. And uh, when we talked with them, they were able to support us as the team members coming from our universities. And then teaching, supervising, Advising and external examinations was one of the impact we could uh, reap from the institutional level. And that means we who are trained be became even lecturers, teachers in our universities of research. And we supervised a lot of our students better because we were able to know research is communication. We advised our universities on research. And eventually, some of us became very good external examiners for universities beyond our own. That was very good. Next slide, please. Opportunities for other universities. We had quite a number of opportunities there. One of them is that the trainers of other, we became trainers of other university staff. When it came to research, we were able to be invited to go and train the academic staff of other universities 
even though we are paid for, but it was good to extend our knowledge, skills on research to these universities. We were also able to advise management of inter-university, we were able to advise on management of inter-university and interdisciplinary research. So some of the universities who were lacking these skills and the few of us, the 30 who were trained, we were able to do something about that. We were in touch with some of the universities to advise them on how to do inter-university and interdisciplinary research, especially related to children. And then improvement of research university ranking was one of the opportunities for other universities. Because these days we hear around the world, universities are ranked based on research output, publications, and the caliber of the staff. And because we were trained, we added that to the other universities' uh, rankings in many ways. Next. Next slide. Learnings. What did I learn as a mentor, as a participant in this uh, training? One of them is research with children is important but challenging. And as I said, we used to think children were not experts. And that was a challenge for us to learn, to unlearn that old way of looking at life. So now we are able to see children as experts also. Research also needs professional collaboration. We saw this and I learned in a hard way too. Some of my colleagues would advise me that, oh, don't do it alone, we can help you. Because we also have expertise in this and that. And that was very helpful for us. And it taught me a lesson also that I can't do it all by myself. I need support from colleagues who are professionals. The other thing is you have the PI, PI the principal investigator involved in this research, organizing the team and so forth. And I found it important that the principal investigator and the team members need to be healthy when they are handling research. Physically, they must be healthy. Emotionally, they must be up to date. And spiritually, and this was important because I had to experience some of this with my team members. Once one was sick, sometimes it would stop our activities for some time and it delayed a lot of things. Prompt financial support for research from the funders and AfriChild was uh, also something I learned. It would affect our progress and this is not good. We need to make sure the teams are supported financially, promptly, on time and so forth. Next slide. We formed friendships and those friendships, we are very good. We don't have to abandon them. And up to now, we are still friends. We support one another. You find during research, we can consult each other. Some even extend this friendship to weddings, to hiring people and so forth. That was very good. Approval of research projects for funding is very long and frustrating. My colleague and mentor, Professor Wiri, had already hinted on that, especially when it comes to approval. Ethics research, ethics review committees are not easy to get on board and do things the way you want. So they have their own schedules and time. Sometimes with the government, you need to seek approval. All this process is very tiresome, long, and frustrating. The need for functional computers and internet connectivity. This is real around the world now when your computer is not functional and you are not connected, hey, things get bad and you may not be able to access the resources that you need. You may not be able to accomplish the work that you need to type on time. Focus on quality research in spite of external pressure from donors. We learned this also in a hard way you get a lot of pressure deadlines do this do this but in the end what you are facing may not be good work so you need also to look at that ethically and say hey this work is not good but i have pressure to finish it the next day so what do i do sometimes you go sleepless to do that and come up with quality work next slide this research training was so good in the sense that we were transformed into professional researchers, teachers, consultants, 
and colleagues that I will never forget in my life. Afri Child and her donors offered us an opportunity to transform our institutions into centers for relevant research and publication. Some of our universities lacked this, but as a result of our training and our interactions with these universities, you find some of the staff members in those universities have now improved a lot in terms of research, especially with the children and the publication output has increased. Respecting our children's experiences and perspectives is vital for enhancing our research outputs and policies related to our children. And that to me was fundamental and important. Thank you very much and may God bless you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Adama. Up next, we have Matthew, which Alfred will be introducing. Yeah, so Matthew, I'm not a researcher and monitor and evaluation specialist. Okay. With over five years experience in insight. Alfred, I'm sorry. Evaluation fields. We're having difficulty hearing you. There's a bit of static. Maybe you can go ahead and introduce him. It's still, it's very staticky. Um, if I'm going to once again ask, feel free to ask questions. We will get to them at the end of our presentations. Um, let me see. At, next up, we have Matthew Amolo. He is a researcher and monitoring and evaluation specialist with over 12 years experience in research and evaluation fields. Currently, Matthew is a research manager at the AfriChild Center, and he oversaw the successful implementation of the inter-university program. Welcome, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you, Evelyn. And thank you to, to the previous presenters as well. So I'm going to present uh, our learnings throughout the three-year uh, three, uh, period and also, and also interactions with the various stakeholders, the mentors, trainers, and the trainees, and also from a, a programmatic perspective. So I, I would like to start from the, the recruitment process. We, one of the challenges that we had was to identify, identify the right mentors and trainers. Or for, for those who are familiar with the, the university schedule, um, some of these professors are not easy to get in terms of their availability and also in terms of um, compensation. But from, from our initial processes, we, we learned that because our budget was, was a minimal budget, it was therefore important for us to identify mentors and trainers who are passionate, are passionate about building capacity, but also sharing, sharing their capacity with others. Because we realized that looking at the budget that we had, it would mean that most of the time for, for these trainers would, would mean that uh, it would be pro bono services. So it, the fashion was very important. And then also looking at the availability, because it was a three year period. At the same time, it was, it was a pilot. We considered the first cohort more of a pilot and reconciling therefore the different university schedules. As you may be aware, some of the, we have the private and public universities and they have different schedules when they're on recess and when they are actually in the active teaching. So that was one of the challenges. So therefore their commitment in terms of availability 
for all of the course modules and also of the classroom sessions was was uh, was one of the issues that we considered and then you know commitment the inter university the the philosophy behind the inter university program was based on you know that willingness to freely share resources with others especially um, academic resources because we know that university have have these resources and often they are project based so the the commitment by the trainers and mentors to share share these resources was also one of the things that we considered and then uh, more evidence uh, Well, no, ignore that. Uh, let's go to the next. Evelyn. The resources in terms when you come to the training, the resources and processes. One we one of the learnings that we were able to derive that yes, the, the universities may have these resources, but also in terms of the utilization, you realize that some of them are actually, for example, the reading materials and software packages, some of them were actually underutilized in most of the universities. And when we interacted with the teams during the, the skills lab and through some of these practical sessions where Africa actually did not have the finances to, to procure these uh, packages, some of the institutions were able to provide the, the data analysis packages free of charge. So then we were able to engage some of them you know why some of these resources are not you know utilized to to, to the expectation or to generate research and it also pointed more into the direction of capacity in terms of monitoring or processes we realized that as you monitor you must be able to generate this finding but also utilize them to improve training so therefore timeliness of of the feedback so what we did before we had more of learning learning in actions and reflecting at the end of the day but we also learned that reflections at the end of the day may not be the most suitable so the trainers continue to give themselves feedback as well as the trainees during the sessions and at the end of each each of the weeks we're able to generate formal feedback through through the training or week evaluation forms mixture of approaches so in terms of the approaches one of the things that we learned especially in the second year is that um, the learners seem to actually learn more passionately when when a trainee is sharing sharing the experience or a unique skill that that might uh, the trainers might be sharing we we realize this with the data analysis for that's quantitative and the qualitative and the the trainers decided that let's let them step back and leave the the trainees to take the lead role and we got very wonderful feedback in terms of in terms of the change in approach uh, in terms of organizing organizing this training at first we thought that we could have you know a fully residential training where we could have all of the trainees the mentors and also the trainers in the same uh, vicinity or next to to the training rooms but we realized that this was almost impossible because the because of the different commitments that the the trainers the mentors and the trainees themselves had so what we decided to do is at least to to organize organize some accommodation for for the for for all the participants and agree that we all conduct our we all are able to complete our assignments and also report report early on time and also at the end of the day 
Next. Next evening. Next. Okay, thank you. One of the 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 aspects that Dr. Dama talked about was, you know, the seed grants where he was sharing the experience in, in actual conducting actual research. This was an an innovative piece for us in the earlier thinking in the project design. We thought that you know training and mentorship would help us to achieve achieve um, our desired outcome. But with the guidance of the trainers and mentors, it was realized that you know Africhel lobbies to identify a seed grant that will facilitate facilitate the trainees to undertake research right from proposal, uh, proposal development to data collection and analysis, and, and then report writing and dissemination. So one of the, one of the gaps that we realized uh, is that, you know, they, they are gaps in, uh, the gaps in research are recognized by the universities. When we talked to the university leadership, the academic, the vice chancellors, they're able to point out that, you know, areas, the area of research is an area that, you know, would benefit them, especially if it focused more on mid-level, but also some senior lecturers. So, and they were willing to undertake, undertake all processes that would support, support, um, learning so we thought that with the incorporation of the seed grants we could facilitate a practical application of knowledge and skills and indeed the feedback that we got was that the the learners appreciated the process and just borrowing from dr dama's experience that yes for example the ethical review processes are frustrating the tedious, and that is the reality. We wanted the trainees to feel what it means to undertake rigorous scientific research. We also realized that the competitive, competitive processes in terms of receiving the award of seed grants motivated the trainees to be able to produce quality research. The trainees, most of them got feedback that they had to revise. I, I, I recall one of the three attempts to revise their proposal and eventually they were able to win the grant. They are so motivated. It also reduced on the attrition the attrition of the trainees. We, we started with 30 trainees and at the end of the training we had, we had 29. It was one of the things that was attributed is the seed grants was able to facilitate application. Next. Yes, uh, I talked about leadership. Uh, in terms of uh, resources, Yes, I talked about it, but one of the things that we, we, we also realize is that there is need to sustain capacity building, but also sharing. Some of, some of these universities have the capacity, but this capacity needs to be shared within the departments, across departments, and across universities. Next. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. And so now we are, have a lot of questions, but please keep sending them in. Um, I'm going to begin with this one and this one. Um, all three can answer. Um, what are the lessons learned from the Ugandan project that can be transferred to other African countries?
Can I go first? I can give a, yes, Prof, go first. So thank you very much, Evelyn, for that question. A very important question, what are the lessons learned? Uh, what we learned is that uh, you can take a heterogeneous group, uh, bring them together, and at the end of the training, they will all be at the same level. You remember we said that uh, at the beginning, we had this training needs assessment, and the, the trainees who are accepted into the program had to score at a certain level to be allowed into the program. But still, when they came in, they were at level, different levels of understanding of research methods, but most especially child-focused research methods. But by the time they got to the end, they had supported each other, and they were very, very homogeneous. Remember, I said that in terms of success rates on the calls for proposals for the seed grants, all of them, we had a 100% success rate. And I think part of it was because of the peer learning. They didn't only learn from the trainers and the mentors, but they learned a lot from themselves, from each other. They supported each other, and they were able to, to see that they all got to the same level. So I would say that is one good uh, issue to, to ensure. And the transforming it to or transferring it to the other countries in Africa, um, making it practically oriented and allowing a lot of skills labs and allowing a lot of group work is what made them as successful as they were. Thank you and over. Thank you, Professor Obiri. Matthew, I, do you have anything to add? Yes, Evelyn. I, one of the things that I, I wanted to highlight is the collaboration and capacity sharing among the academics. We realized that you know when they worked across universities, especially in uh, in some of the calls, because they gave them other external calls to practice. We realized that some of them were even able to take this further. So we thought that. One of the things that we're learning is, you know, academics can actually generate more research evidence if they worked together uh, rather than competing. Because at the end of the day, we were making a contribution, you know, to the body of knowledge. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Matthew. We have um, another question. We have two questions, and I'm kind of going to try to put them together is um, one is do you plan to organize similar research training sessions online for individuals who have interest to acquire similar skills and also um, what do the presenters think about the role of technology in making such a training available in other parts of the world are there any plans for this i can go first uh, one of the processes that we have initiated internally at AfriChild is to uh, standardize the training materials. Already we are in touch with the, with the, the distance and uh, external studies the, the department within Makerere University and also we other online platforms within, within the various universities. But first process is for us to standardize the materials. It's one of the things, the online training is one of the things that we want to explore to see you know, how best can AfriChild um, roll this out to benefit other academics, but also practitioners, because we have another component as well that focuses on practitioners. Great, thank you. Thank you. That's something we can look forward to in the future. Dr. Can I just add one thing? Just, just one point regarding the second part of the question. Uh, during this period um, of COVID and the working from home, there has been increased usage of online platforms for virtual learning, including virtual meetings and the disseminations and webinars as well. And the, the infrastructure to make that happen has actually improved, although it's been a short time, it has improved. And more people are becoming more and more accustomed to virtual learning and the webinars and the fora for dissemination of their research findings. 
So I think going forward, this is going to be a new normal and we'll begin to see more of this. And so some of us who are in the university as trainers, uh, it's a challenge to us to make training really available online and at a distance so that not only Ugandans can benefit, but also other target audiences all over Africa. Thank you and over. Thank you so much. Um, similarly, uh, I have I have actually a lot of questions asking if there's hope to have another training in the future for people who weren't able to participate in this round. Um, you spoke a little bit about putting this on paper and standardizing it and possibly doing online trainings. Um, but is there also opportunities for more in-person trainings when maybe the COVID era comes to an end? Yes, Evelyn. Um, currently, the team at AfriChild is, is in the process of identifying the best, uh, the best way to implement uh, the second cohort uh, of these trainings. The initial, we considered the first one more of our pilot and what we are doing currently an evaluation to be able to concretize some of these learnings and also design design issues. And I'm sure one of the things that is being explored is the online training. How best can we be able to reach more, a more, more university faculty and also you know, those interested in the child protection space? Great, thank you, Matthew. Um, is there, I, if you guys could speak to this on some examples of research that has come out of this training from the mentees or mentors. Do you have any examples of the research that is being conducted or has been conducted? Uh, uh, first Dr. Daman, do you want to go first? <laughs> Oh, sure, Prof. Oh. Well, maybe I just say briefly, and then Dr. Odama can come in. Uh, as the, I mentioned in my presentation, uh, we had seven universities and higher institutions of learning, and we had seven uh, grants that were awarded. So each university had a grant awarded to go and undertake research and prepare it all the way up to the dissemination phase. Uh, a lot of these studies were disseminated and the examples are available. So I just wanted to say that, and then Dr. Odama or Matthew can come in with the examples of the individual bits of research. But every university which participated at least had something to disseminate. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Evelyn also just maybe the broader areas that I can speak about from the from the seven the researchers from the seven universities. Um, we had studies that were focusing on on child labor and its effects on uh, on children. We also had studies that focused on you know uh, 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 children retention in school. We had another study that focused on menstrual hygiene and how you know the boys could participate in supporting the girl child. Um, then we also had um, also another on on child retention, but focusing on fishing communities. Those are the, the broader areas that I can I, I can I can share. But we have all the the seven studies online and published. Uh, also at the AfriChild website. We have other plans to be able to, to generate um, academic papers to be able to benefit you know, a wider audience with this evidence. Great, thank, thank you. you. Much, Matthew. Dr. Adama, do you have anything to add? You're currently on mute, but I can unmute you. Okay, please. 
thank you very much for this opportunity. However, mine is more an emphasis related to our study from my university, which Matthew had mentioned briefly. It is on the effect of child or effect of child labor on students or children's education and health. So that was the major study we did. And there are quite many others that Matthew had already highlighted earlier. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our presenters. We've reached time. It is 10.01 for me. Um, I'm going to just allow any of the presenters to say last words, if there's anything to say. Yes, Evelyn, maybe from my end is to appreciate everyone to for having made time to to provide provide us this opportunity to share what we're doing at Africa and uh, and we hope that you know they will be able to get interested in this this work that we're doing and also the research evidence that is being generated by these these parties locally with the aim of you know shaping uh, this question around uh, child being in, in Uganda and also Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Dr. Adama. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm going to take note of all the questions that were asked um, and we will get back to you with an answer. Um, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you'll like, you're able to join us in our next webinar in this joint series. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, and bye-bye.